Welcome to the Human Origin Project, where we explore the science of you. To keep up to date, go to our iTunes channel and subscribe, and please leave a review if you enjoyed today's show. Do we really know the age of the Sphinx? Before it was uncovered in the 1930s, rooms of the Great Sphinx echoed through ancient cultures. Today, the same statue still encapsulates the minds of people around the globe. In this episode, Stefan and I explore the mainstream archaeological dating of the Sphinx and the theories that have challenged these for decades. Scientific theories are broken when the counter-argument builds enough evidence to overcome convention. Are we on the brink of accepting an older date of the Sphinx? It's a problem that spans disciplines, generations and continents. Let's explore the riddle of the Sphinx. Hey Steve, how you doing? I'm good, Steph. How are you, man? Yeah, good. Just uh, cooked up a little feast for dinner for uh, for you guys. I've um I've come up to Sydney. I've come up from Sydney and um spending a bit of time up the coast, which is it's always nice. The sun was out today, which was pretty sweet. It was really hot. We always end up talking about the weather at the start. I <laughs> know <Yeah>. so. <laughs> a bit of awkward chit chat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but today we're going to be chatting about the uh, Great Sphinx of Giza, which is a. Uh, one of the most amazing carved sculptures on the planet still to this day and uh it's got a bit of a interesting history about it yeah um this is one that is kind of goes back to nearly two decades now of um conjecture as to the the origin and the age um but the sphinx is one of the most you know famous archaeological sites on the planet you know millions of people visit it worldwide and you know, very few people probably um, are unfamiliar with the Sphinx. But the, there's an amazing story behind it, isn't there? And it's something that there was this, obviously, even in the early 90s, uh, 1900s, when it was discovered, it's really been embedded into um, human culture and the psyche of understanding what it is. And I, I, you know, we've kind of just been, we've been looking at this for a while now, and there's still a lot to, to discover. Yeah, there's so much. Even in, yeah, even it's probably one of the things that really got me interested in looking at ancient sites and ancient cultures were these huge megalithic structures and and when you find out that there are these mysteries surrounding them and debate as to you know who built them, why they were built, how old they are, it just yeah, it's really uh, it's really it's nice to be able to you know look through the history and realize that the it's the debate's still going as to all these questions that have you know puzzled people for as you said hundreds. And thousands of years. Yeah, and that's the exact um, riddle of the Sphinx is that, you know, the question of the age, um, you know, you kind of assume that, it, that it's known, you know, when the Sphinx is built, uh, but when you kind of really dig into it, it becomes a bit murky. Yeah, but so the Sphinx, uh, for those that haven't visited, um, is located on the, the Giza Plateau in near Cairo. Um, it's actually located below ground on the site um, where, you know, because it's the, the site's level at different um, uh, different sea levels, isn't it? So, and it's, it's one of the biggest monoliths in the world. Um, so it has a, is it a height of sixty six feet by two and length of two forty? Yeah, sixty six feet high, two forty feet long, um, which is about twenty meters long, uh, twenty meters high by about seventy five ish meters long, which is huge. I mean, you see photos of it, and you can look at pictures on Google Earth, but seeing it in the flesh, it's just, I, I mean, I haven't seen it in the flesh, but I can imagine it would be insane to, to, you know, just try and perceive how these, how it was built and who decided to build it. It's, yeah, it's, it blows my mind for sure. Yeah, and it's carved out of a single block, so it's the biggest monolithic, well, um, supposedly one of the biggest um, monoliths on the planet, which you don't really kind of perceive, but so if you think of the statue... Um, there's actually an enclosure around it, which is like a wall surrounding the Sphinx. And, um, you know, it's thought that it was originally a head that was then carved um, around it. And the blocks were actually used to build temples adjacent to the Sphinx. Yeah, and that's that's what I found fascinating. You know, like the, the blocks that you see, I think it was the, the Sphinx Temple and the Valley Temple were built by the blocks that they removed from carving the sphinx and when you see the size of these blocks you know some of them are like 50 plus uh, tons in size and they they were carved out as you go down as they went down carving out the sphinx from the solid limestone bedrock it's just like it's uh, it's unbelievable as to how they did it 
Yeah, for those that aren't familiar, the, the Sphinx Temple is probably lesser known, isn't it? But the if you kind of look at the pictures of it, you see the the you know, the huge um, yeah megalithic block building that you see all around the world, um, and you know how they transport these things and how they they can, they cut and construct these things is is really you know, it does boggle my mind. Um, but so yeah, the structure itself is. Um, it's a lion's body, isn't it? But and there's a there's a human head on it who supposedly um, represents the the um, the pharaoh that that made the sphinx. But the, it is oddly shaped as well. So it's it's a very big body, and the, the head is unusually small when you think of the proportions, especially considering how um, how good Egyptians were with uh, building things to biological portion it's somewhat out yeah absolutely there, there are granite statues of ramses the second and all these other pharaohs that have they've they've done scans on the symmetry of them and that they're carved out of solid granite which is extremely hard stone and they they find that the symmetry is almost perfect um so if you're building if you can build temp if you can build um structures and and pharaohs out of stone to that degree of precision then it's it is a bit strange to, to not get the anatomy right of a lion with a human's head um so yeah that just adds to the mystery of it you know why why was it like that why why are the sizes slightly out um but it was sort of a legend throughout the ancient world i think that's how it was first discovered and, and uncovered because it was buried for who knows how long hundreds if not thousands of years under the sands of egypt um I think it was 1817 that Captain Caviglia and his men, 100, 160 men strong, tried to uncover the Sphinx. They, they'd come and seen the head poking out of the sand and there was so much sand filling back in as they were digging it out that, um, that they, couldn't, they, couldn't get the, they couldn't uncover the entire um, Sphinx itself because they, no matter how many men they had and how long they dug for, they couldn't reveal it, which kind of shows you the scale and the size of this thing. Yeah, the the legend echoed through Greece and Rome, I think, and so um, the the I think it was the tip of the head that was exposed at some point, and then yeah, they, imagine how frustrating it was when you're going into this to uncover this legendary statue, and then all this sand just you're digging it out with 160 people, and it keeps flowing back in. It'll just be really shattering <laughs> but then so it wasn't until the, the 20s or 30s that an archaeologist Salim Has, Hassan um yeah, the late 30s um actually took a team to dig out um the, and actually uncovered and excavated this thing so it was really recent you know that was you know during the world war world war ii which is quite bizarre um you know that, that was actually uncovered and so you know with that kind of short history it it kind of explains why you know we don't potentially know the full story of it um yeah it hasn't even been a hundred years since it, it was completely uncovered and revealed to the world i mean you know what it's like now and there's millions of people visiting it but if it wasn't for the you know the the painstaking attempts by these old archaeologists archaeologists it may have never been uncovered fully it may have just remained a enigmatic part of egypt like so much of egypt is still under, under the ground maybe the sphinx could have been the same yeah, and that that really surprised me about the story of it, that there was a um, you know relatively young you know uncovering and you know, the the new world really didn't know about it in great detail, but the the Sphinx itself echoes throughout Egyptian culture. Um, you know, there's the Sphinx in Luxor, isn't it? And Amun, um, the Temple of Amun has nine hundred sphinxes um, with ram heads, so it's the bot the animal body with, with the different. Well, the lion body and the ram head, um, and and the Sphinx actually echoes throughout you know many different cultures from Greece even to Rome. That was, they've got, kind of got a modern version of the Sphinx, so it, it transcends culture. Um, and over thousands of years, China and Ireland, um, and it, yeah, it's this it seems to be this symbolic character. That so in Greece, I think it was the uh, at the the gateway of the city Thebes and you had to answer the the sphinx riddle or you'd be eaten whole before you entered um so she was like the knowledge keeper but there it there it really did this 
the symbol of the Sphinx did seem to transcend throughout different um, cultures and civilizations. And, um, you know, it's, it's widely accepted that the, the Sphinx, among many other um, symbolic reasons, was the guardian of Egypt. You know, it, it has connections to the Great Pyramid of Giza. With this, there's, a, there's an ancient causeway that connects the pyramid to the Sphinx, which has led some people to believe that the Sphinx was built at around the same time that the pyramid was built to um, to protect the pharaoh as he went through to the afterlife. Um, but I think it's it's attributed to the pharaoh Khafre at around 2500 BC, give or take a little bit here or there. But um, yeah, it seems it seems that that date has stuck to a lot of researchers of Egypt to um, to try and pinpoint the exact date that it was built but it, it's interesting that the Egyptians themselves didn't there's no text describing them building it there's no text just talking about when it was built or why it was built or who built it there are there are definitely texts talking about the repair jobs that were done and there seems to be have been quite a few repair jobs even today there's repairs going on at the Sphinx um, so it's this ongoing process but in terms of when it was built um, in terms of the Egyptians' perspective, they don't really have a set. Uh, there's no set um, dialogue on that specifically, which has been the interesting entry point for a lot of other researchers coming up with different ideas of when it was built. Yeah, because the Egyptians were so um, so diligent in recording their history and their beliefs um, and their you know what happened in their daily lives. Um, and and interesting, there's a stella on the front of the Sphinx. Uh, that's dated to 1400 BC of King Tutmosis and how he rediscovered the Sphinx whilst dreaming and he, he dreamt himself sleeping in the shadow of the head of the Sphinx and he was it was told by the um, by the Sphinx itself that if he uncovered it that he would become king and then he did become king and this was supposedly how it was rediscovered but, but that kind of tells that the Sphinx itself was lost in a way and it, it kind of builds some uncertainty even within Egyptian culture about who built it and so it, there's this strange mystery that kind of um you know pervades through uh you know without direct evidence you know this the causeway that you describe so if you think of the the Giza plateau there's this running down to the um it, from the from the, it was a Khafre uh, pyramid to the to the Sphinx temple and that's how they attribute it to to Khafre but we really don't have anything else there's no hieroglyphs nothing um, there are some other new kind, newer kind of um, discoveries on that, which we'll cover later. Um, but today we're mainly going to look at the, the dating of the Sphinx, which is based, and that's more or less what conventional archaeology has looked at um, and what the textbooks say. And so, you know, but then in the 90s, there was a guy named John Anthony West that um, spent a lot of time in Egypt and was an independent researcher, and he had a different theory, didn't he? Yeah, he was a fascinating man. If any, if anyone listening has not come across John Anthony West, I really recommend checking him out. You know, he's got a few books out. He's got he he's made a lot of documentaries. He's done a lot of podcasts. Sadly, he passed away last year, um, but he spent the majority of his his life, you know, looking through Egypt, reading the records, trying to understand exactly what um, you know what the history was and what the symbol symbolic meaning for a lot of the temples were and he just did a, an incredible job in giving us a lot of the information we have today. You know, he's, he spent decades, literally decades in Egypt trying to work out what, what was going on and trying to put the, pic, put the story together because he, he found the traditional ways of looking at Egypt were missing quite a lot of the picture. Yeah, what I like about Wes is that he based his work on the writings of Shaw de Lubix, who is who was a French anthropologist that spent many years in Egypt um, through the 20s and 30s and, and wrote um, a set of books called The Temple of Man, which are some of the most remarkable books, very, very difficult to read, but he actually translated them from French into English. And yeah, yeah it's the books themselves, you know, I'm still tackling them, but it, they are the things that Lubix wrote about um, Egyptian culture and their knowledge and uh, particularly the, the building of the Temple of Luxor, uh, that was something that really struck West and that led him into thinking of like this and the thing about the whole story there was a documentary um, created 
for it in the, in the early 90s. But since then, the story has really played out. And the geologist, he actually contacted a geologist based on a line that, that Schwalder de Lubix wrote in the Temple of Man saying that the Sphinx is far older than what um, what is, is conventionally dated to. Yeah, it was like it was just like a throwaway line. It didn't have a chapter de- dedicated to it or anything. It was pretty much saying, and obviously we know the Sphinx shows unmistakable signs of water-induced weathering or, or something to that effect, which to anyone else reading Chwala de Lubitz, not that that many people were <laughs> at the time, um, but that stood out to West because he realised that this was potentially the ticket that he'd been looking forward to because he was always under the impression that, that Egypt was a lot older because this high knowledge and high science that, that seemed to um, reflect through the, the temple building and the myths and the legends and everything. He, he he thought there was more to it and this this line got him so inspired that he called um, yeah Robert Shock over in 1990 to really start this this debate of the you know the mystery of the Sphinx which is still going today which is um, unbelievable. Yeah, and Shock's a faculty member at the Boston University. Uh, he's a geologist by training. Um, and so West, his goal was to find someone who would um, independently date the rocks around the Sphinx um, to see if there was anything to um, Schroller's uh, theory. And so he took pictures to, um, I think it was Boston, or it was probably back in those days, he had to go physically there. Uh, and then without showing him it was the Sphinx, he basically got people to agree, but then once they knew it was the Sphinx, they wouldn't go and investigate it. But um, Shock was actually someone who was interested enough to go and have a look, but he was you know, very much wanted to see the evidence himself and make the assessment. And he describes the first kind of five minutes of looking at the site and you know, basically citing Geology 101 that this was um, water-induced weathering on the, the walls of the Sphinx enclosure. And if you look at the Sphinx enclosure, there are these um, basically groove lines, deep groove lines, single groove lines running down in vertical lines. And um, in geological terms, that pattern can only be made when there's a large amount of water running over the rock for a very minute, or for either a long time or a large volume um, running through. And so in geology, geology they either um, categorize where on rock patterns to to wind or water and this to shock was just clearly 101 um, water erosion and it kind of speaks to something that you know scientific um, disciplines have suffered from like not looking outside there because geologists and archaeologists do clash a lot and this is one of the classic examples that you know there's obviously a lot to learn from what other scientific disciplines offer and shock just straight up gave his alternative theory and it, it unwound the whole story from there didn't it? yeah it was it's it's unbelievable it's still going and there's there's been debates for the last yeah the last 30 years almost um going back and forth with you know this geologist presenting evidence and building cases and writing books about the evidence he's found in the rock um and then the the mainly the Egyptological Society trying to refute his his um, his claims by saying that no no we don't see any evidence of this in Egypt um, they can't possibly it can't possibly be older because we all know Egypt we all know it was built at this time by this by this pharaoh and here here comes a geologist saying well the evidence is in the rock um, maybe we should investigate this and there was just a huge clash. Um, but I think that one of the first things he said to West was something like, "Oh my God, these these rocks look thousands and thousands of years old." And then sort of turned to West and said, "Oh, don't don't quote me on that." Um, so I think you know, Shock is a very meticulous um, geologist. So I think that's really important to note. He he frustrated John Anthony West so much because he was so strict about his collecting data, and they'd go back year after year and. Shock was trying to make sure that he hadn't missed something because it, in his mind he was, he thought he was going crazy thinking that he'd seen something that all these other people had missed. He was like, there must be something I'm missing. But um, yeah, it turns out he still hasn't found the thing he's missing. He's still trying to put the case together that the Sphinx is much older. Yeah, but he he published a lot of data um, around you know the geological evidence behind the dating of the Sphinx, and he actually. You know, there's the the rainfall weathering that most people, if you've heard the story, 
are kind of familiar with and that's the most obvious, but they actually did a lot of other um, a lot of other measurements you know, where, where they did seismic um, measurements where they they send seismic waves into the um, the, the floor of the Sphinx um, enclosure, and you can actually measure the um, it's, it's the da- it's a dating technique, isn't it? Yeah, they basically have a steel plate um, connected to connected to this electronic device and they hit it with a sledgehammer and it sends shock waves down through the rock um, and sort of goes through the soft rock until it hits bedrock which is obviously not being carved or um, eroded and then comes back up so they can sort of get a picture of you know different parts of the they did this in the sphinx enclosure different parts of that enclosure to see how the weathering worked and if it was all uniform which it should be um, but it turned out that it wasn't uniform which is interesting which um, it was sort of the front and the and the sides of the Sphinx enclosure were a lot deeper than the back. And Shock's conclusion was that it must have been that the back of the Sphinx enclosure was carved out much later than the front, which um, which kind of points to this idea that he has that yes, there was a lot of work done to the Sphinx at 2500 BC, like most people agree on, but it wasn't the original building of the Sphinx. It was just this restoration that sort of went on. Um, and there's there's lots of other evidence too, which is really I've found interesting. You know, there are these there's a place called Saqqara, and there's these old mastabas that were built out of mud bricks, um, which, generally speaking, should erode quite quickly because it's made of mud, not rock. Um, but these mastabas were built long before the Sphinx is thought to have been built, back in um, yeah later than 2500 BC. Um, but they don't show any signs of any signs of weathering anywhere near as bad as the Sphinx does. So Shock's kind of saying there's there's all these other examples of of mud that hasn't even eroded. So how can it be possible that these that these rocks have eroded so badly? And you can see in the Sphinx enclosure the, the weathering is is really, really intense. You know, it's gone back um, three to five feet in some cases and it's it's really they, they, the rocks look really old. I mean I'm not a geologist but when you when you see side by side comparisons of a temple and rock that should be they should be eroded similarly and you see the mud um, that hasn't eroded as badly it's it's pretty interesting and it's quite compelling um, because you know it's not you're looking at rock it's it's not there's not too many lies a rock can tell you which is um something i found really interesting well and then th- that this brings in another area of science in meteorology or archaeometeorology where you have to start thinking Okay, so if this is a weather pattern that does indicate that there was rainfall or waterfall, uh, when would this be? And you have to go back to the end of the last ice age, um, you know, roughly you know, around 11,000 years ago, to find that kind of rain- rainfall on the Giza-, Giza Plateau. And so then we're starting to move into this zone of, um, you know, it's, it's a very unfamiliar environment to, you know, the desert Um the desert conditions of the uh, the Sahara Desert, and so that was very unfamiliar in the '90s. But now we're starting to see that this is, you know, very much reality. Where there's a lot of the climate um, and geological data from uh, this period is known, you know, that there was a lot of, uh, you know, a very different environment happening on, on the planet. Lots of rainfall, lots of um, sea level rises, um, you know, potentially, you know, big areas being flooded, and so. It, it's starting to fit into a picture that that you know perhaps Shock and West were onto something that they that the scientific community hadn't really gathered enough um, you know collective data on to really understand. Uh, but so when you start to kind of bring all these different pieces of the puzzle, then it really begins the mystery becomes quite interesting because you know if the Sphinx does show weathering patterns in this way, you know was it present you know before the end of the last ice age or you know during. Which would make it, you know, far, far older. You know, so we're talking, you know, well back before dynastic Egypt. Now this is um, dating, you know, long before any um, known uh, human civilization or recorded human civilization existed on Earth. And this is this is why it was so controversial, wasn't it? And there's, um, you know, there's many parts of the of this of this also that, like for instance, it does seem to be built in. Um, in like layers or periods so like there are different styles of buildings so for instance the the temple itself 
um, the blocks and the style of building of the temple was quite different. And you see this pattern all over the world as well, where sites were reappropriated. And the Sphinx itself was repaired many times. And this actually built on some of Shock's evidence too, didn't it? Yeah, because there were there were peri- there were there were there's evidence for repair in the Sphinx that um, was ta- was carried out at around 2000 BC. So so roughly 500 years after the Sphinx is thought to have been carved. Um, but those that erosion that are weathering in some places was already three feet deep, which seems almost unbelievable in in a geological sense because that should have taken hundreds or thousands of sorry should have taken thousands of years to erode that much Um, especially as you were saying at the the hyper arid conditions of the sahara at that time you know it's desert there's no rain so if it's if it doesn't appear to be wind eroded by wind then yeah you have to start looking back to when when was it raining um that much in egypt and yeah it's it's a long time ago (laughs) um and it, it would yeah, but they've also dated the um, so the the temples that they made when they carved the Sphinx, the Sphinx Temple and the Valley Temple, which we were talking about before. Um, they've done they've done surface luminescence dating on the stones. Um, the those two temples were repaired around around twenty five hundred BC as well, and um, the old limestone rocks were covered with fresh granite stones, which are still there today in pretty perfect condition. Um, so they took date. They took dates of, of this granite and found that the granite dates to around the period of between 2500 and 2000 BC, which is it's it's hard with dating rock because there's quite um, a lot of discrepancies in the numbers. But it, it roughly translates to the period that the Sphinx is thought to have been built, which adds to Shock's theory a little bit in that it could have been a repair job on the Sphinx as well as on the on the temples because if you look at the rocks behind the temple behind those new granite blocks they're severely weathered and they're they're eroded away so badly that you know they're splitting and they're falling off and these new granite boulders make the temple appear like it's new but if you if you take a look behind them there it's it looks ancient it looks much older than um it does after the the granite repairs have been done yeah, one thing, like, just eyeballing the Sphinx, it does look remarkably older than the pyramid, doesn't it? Like, it seems strange that, you know, just by that kind of, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's kind of, you know, thin slicing where you take that, um, the first impression, the Sphinx really feels older. But it, and it, it also, it's, it's deceiving because it's been um, worked on and, and changed so many times. So the body actually, you know, dates to many different kind of... Um, uh, Time, time zones because they've, they've repaired it and, and so you don't really get a, a true sense but when you look at those areas that, that do have this weather uh, pat, pat that does look a lot older and as you say the repair um, patterns on the, on the Sphinx add to that as well overall I mean like for me you know I'm not geo- geologically trained and you know I've, I've read a lot of Shock's work and I've, I've read a lot of the other like I was really interested in what the scientific community you know, responded to this because there at the time there wasn't any real, um, you know, any real scientific response to this besides that there weren't any, um, you know, existing cultures to build this in the time frame that he's talking about. So it can't make sense. Since then, we know that there's a lot more going on. Um, but in that time, also, there's been a number of geological responses, but also the archaeological community seemed to. Um, quote a, a theory on haloclasty, which um, you know says that you can get salt water. Um, is it diffusing through the rock that can cause uh, the the erosion pattern? So you don't have to have exposure to um, you know to running water. Um, yeah, and moisture. So it, it actually the mechanism is via moisture in the air and dew entering the cracks of the limestone. But um, I mean, look, I can't exactly comment on that, but uh, it, 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 it it doesn't seem, you know, considering um, certainly we should be looking at alternative theories, um, that to me doesn't really seem to explain it. And there's a number of other anomalies that kind of point to, you know, there's more to the story. Yeah, and I, I think it's really interesting looking at the, um, looking at the argument now that there are so many different disciplines researching it. You know, when Shock and West first went there, they were dismissed immediately because you know they're not Egyptologists. John Anthony West, to a lot of 
trained Egyptologist and archaeologist. You know, he wasn't very liked because he was he was coming over to Egypt with these wild, seemingly wild theories, and you know, bringing his his bringing his uh, geologist friend over with him. It just it was he was an easy target because he was he was almost like the outsider, um, and you know, his ideas were were pretty out there at the time because you know we didn't the the evidence of these you know the the end of the last ice age the the earth changes that happened at that time weren't really known so what shock was talking about seemed like what shock and west were talking about seemed like a wild fairy tale but now that there is more evidence coming out of these earth changes and now that there is a context that this the the origins of the sphinx can fit into quite easily it it does open the question you know do we need to be looking back at this period and um one of the main arguments which it was fair enough was well if the sphinx is so old where are the other where are the other temples dating to this time you know where's the pottery where's any evidence give us one piece of evidence and we'll we might consider your theory but the fact that that you're saying that the, the sphinx is so old but there's nothing else on the planet that old it that was one thing that they they really took shock down on because he had no defense for that he was just you know he was trying to say he he, he understands that point but you know the rocks telling him this other story so maybe there is something we haven't found and they did yeah there has been a few things found in that in the last you know sort of five or ten years that have sort of challenged the the current model well it was actually um you know it was only four years in 94 gebekli tepe was um you know just being dug up and they didn't have the data on it then but you know since then malta and sardinia for instance have um you know large uh, you know, kind of megalithic building um, cultures that have been unearthed that aren't very, you know, conventionally referenced in terms of their age. But the, you know, the, the island of Sardinia is covered in these huge um, and also very precision, similar to, you know, the kind of um, rock carvings that we see in, in the Sphinx Temple. Um, Malta the same, um, and you know, it, it does kind of lend to a story. It, it, since you know shock and west time the evidence has only begun to build up you know in terms of what we've understood about the earth um but also too about the the uh age of civilizations it's everything you know and it makes sense you know because you know you think about how much of the archaeological record that we've uncovered in Egypt, it's less than you know it's probably one percent or something like that um so you know as we dig deeper we learn more and and so forth it's happening all over the world um, but the the big one too is the the multidisciplinary view of how um, you know how, how we can actually date these things. And one big field um, that's really interesting is the archaeoastronomy, where the alignments to um, astronomical phenomena can give us dates. Because we've got, it's amazing, you can use the software to actually go back in time and look at the sky and see when this would be. And the Giza Plateau, you know via conventional archaeology, you know, Mark Lenner, who did a lot of the surveying of the, um, the Sphinx and the Giza Plateau, you know, noted the, that it was an equinoctial marker and that um, the Sphinx itself uh, marks the when the, the, the sun rises on the, the vernal equinox, which rises directly over the head of the Sphinx. And then so you know, we're now into the kind of area where we, you know, should really be thinking about, you know, was this a marker for, you know, the procession of the equinoxes, which is a 26,000 year cycle, we're beginning to see that there is, you know, maybe another line of evidence there that we can piece all of this together to start thinking about, you know, whether um, the Sphinx actually is older and whether Egyptian culture does go back further or, that, or whether it was a pre-culture that they adopted. Yeah, m- much like many of the ancient structures across the planet that were built, you know, in bygone eras many of them were were aligned to you know are still aligned to the uh sunrise at the equinox or or the solstices um you know they were these markers and yeah that there is that really interesting new field of archaeoastronomy that sort of is looking at dating dating these monuments because they all seem to have aligned to the stars on purpose that you can you can turn turn back the heavens in a way turn back and look at where these monuments were pointing to specific stars during specific periods and because the sphinx points directly east it is the perfect equinoctial marker you know it it's still today thousands of people go and watch the sunrise on the equinox because it's still perfectly yeah as you said rises between the pores um and it does make it interesting if you 
think of it as an equitoctum, as a marker of the equinoxes, <clears throat> um, because obviously the Sphinx is a is a lion, so it could potentially be representing the constellation Leo, which is which which throws back, which which would throw it back to the 10,000 BC era, which is similar to when these when these floods were happening, similar to when the rainfall was happening in Egypt. So there's these little clues which are putting together quite a remarkable story if it, you know, if it turns out to be true, which is a, a pretty wild thought. Yeah, completely that. Um, but I've, like, once you kind of see this, the story start to amass you, your mind really runs. But, I mean, we are in the situation now where we really, you know, don't know if we're, if we're honest about what we, you know, you, you know, we can conclude that there were, you know, turbulent weather um, events you know, during this time you know we we're at the point now where potentially you know we can start to you know what would be the point where we, we can predate um, Egyptian um, you know civilization and so those kind of things really do you know it, I think it's going to really bring a you know a lot of different scientific fields to 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 break this open because you know when you when you stay in your own kind of um, um, you know special specialization you don't see you know what you know great sciences are doing in with different perspectives and yeah that that's that that, that goes across all scientific uh, fields and you know I think we're in the period now where we've all gathered our own um, you know, data and understanding of very detailed scientific fields but it's 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 a time to begin to collate that. And um, you know, build a better understanding. And if, if it means that human civilization goes back earlier, then we really need to know that. Um, and one thing too is that you know, you see the Sphinx, as we said at the start, it does resonate through cultures. It resonates from Egypt into the future through Greece to Rome, through you know, Ireland and China, which is really quite bizarre. So it, it, it there is a pattern there of it being transmitted through time. So. You know, it's an equinoctial marker. That, that to me, is enough to investigate further. If, you know, whether this is really older. But shock really kind of lays down that that hard geological evidence. Um, you know, that hasn't been quite conventionally accepted. But it's really, I think, there's enough. Um, you know, effort and credibility and um, you know scientific method there to to take this seriously. Yeah, and it's, it's such a. It's, I've found this. You know, working on the Human Origin Project and seeing and being able to look into all these different disciplines and interview people and share ideas, it's really, I, I can't imagine doing it any other way. You know, being able to talk about geology, being able to talk about astronomy, being able to mix the two, it seems so natural. You know, the Egyptians built their culture on astronomy, built their culture on um, out of stone. They mix the two. I, I feel like it's, a, it's important that we get our mindset back to an almost Egyptian way of thinking that there's more than just our perception of the Egyptians you know what were they saying about themselves what were they um, what were their myths and what were they what, what was their lifestyle and their culture about and you know some of the myths a lot of them talk about this first time which you know could potentially be pointing back to this Gobekli Tepe region um, era sorry that you know when everything sort of began or rebooted or whatever it is um but yeah, it's really, I, I find it really, really interesting thinking when you can think like that and when you can open your mind to, to a varied um, class of disciplines, it is, yeah, the picture that starts getting laid out is, is gets a little bit clearer in a way. Although there's, you know, it is, it is a long story, but yeah, it's, it's interesting nonetheless. Yeah, and, and one thing I've found that's really enriching too is that everyone has their own ideas and kind of they put their own you know, minds and skill sets to things and it really does bring out you know interesting ways to look at things and you know if, if if it's just that you know i think it's worthwhile you know kind of you know spending that that time to to, to open your perspective a bit i think this is this is definitely a topic we'll cover there's a lot to cover on the sphinx there there's an article up on the website called the riddle of the sphinx and there's a there's a nice video to play that kind of summa, summarizes uh, a lot of shocks work in the general um, state of what we know about the aging of the Sphinx. There's a lot more um, to look into. There's the, the head of the Sphinx. There's also uh, some new research that Shock is doing on uh, the name of the Sphinx, which is really interesting. That comes out of Egyptian hieroglyphs that you're really into at the moment, Steph. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm going a bit crazy trying to learn about hieroglyphs, but it's um, 
there's so much to it. It's fascinating. But yeah, that's a that's a topic we should um, we should investigate another time. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting into you know some some of the some of the other theories about the Sphinx and you know talk opening this conversation up because it is so interesting and there are so you know it's been going for so long there's there's a lot to get through but yeah we'll um we'll get there we'll get there yeah so anyone listening please leave your comments and thoughts on the age of the sphinx and what you think about uh you know the different theories and you know what you'd like to us to cover on the sphinx as well all right i think we covered that pretty well yeah there's a lot, there's a lot of detail in that isn't it yeah there's a lot we could talk about this forever i mean there's yeah yeah <laughs> looking forward to um unpacking it a bit more definitely all right i'll see you next week yeah (laughs) see you man thank you for listening to today's show for more information you can read the full transcript articles and discussion on our website humanoriginproject.com you can visit us on social media at human origin project on facebook and the human origin project on instagram follow us on twitter or join the forum boards and email list to keep up to date with all the new information. And if you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review because it helps others to find this information and helps us to bring you the topics you want to discuss and hear about. Until next week, I hope your life is filled with happiness, healthiness, and harmony.